Cancer Council New South Wales acknowledges the traditional custodians, both past and present, of the lands on which we live and work. Welcome to you all. My name is Lauren McLean and tonight we will be discussing fertility. Just some housekeeping to start with. For any technical problems, please use the number in your chat box, um, 1800 733 416. If you have any sound problems, you're able to listen on your phone by calling the 1800 and entering the passcode shown in the chat box. We encourage you to use the chat box tonight. Support one another. Tell us what you're thinking. How are you feeling? Maybe share a question with us which we can pose to the panel later on. We cannot provide any specific medical advice this evening, but we encourage you to consult with your treating specialist or your GP. This webinar is being recorded, so if you get distracted by the chat box or miss something, um, you will be able to watch it later. If at any stage you need to speak with someone urgently, please do not hesitate to contact a Lifeline counsellor on 13 11 14, available 24 7. So let's get started. First I'd like to introduce our panel. Welcome to Professor William Ledger and Rebecca Deans. Thank you both for joining us tonight. So I'll hand over now uh, to Bill. Yep. There we go. Over to you. Great. Well, thanks, Lauren. It's good to be here. It's lovely to be working with my good friend, Beck. Um, so I'm up first. And just to introduce myself briefly, uh, my real job is at the Royal Hospital for Women. I'm the head of obstetrics and gynecology at the academic university department of obstetrics and gynecology at the Royal. I head up reproductive medicine. I have quite a big research profile in fertility and fertility after cancer. And I also work at UNSW as a senior vice dean. So what we're going to talk about tonight are the effects of cancer therapies on the fertility of women and men, and what people can do after cancer treatment in order to have a family. And one thing that I see every day is that the one of the great desires of, of our patients after they've come through their treatment is just to get back to normal, to go back to a life that they expected to have, that their brothers and their sisters and their friends have, and that their parents expect. So part of that for many people is having a family, is having kids, and so the work that the two of us do along with our colleagues is trying to help people to achieve that. So when I was a young doctor, I'm much older than these two lovely people next to me. My first ever job in medicine was on a hematology ward in a big hospital. And I was the junior, so I had the kind of day-to-day -day responsibility to do all the mundane work to help the main doctors do their job. And I did that job for six months. And at the end of that six months, every single patient that I'd started working with had passed away. And that had a big effect on my career. And I still remember vividly some of the people I was trying to work with and help. And one of the main things that has impressed me over my now 30-year career in medicine is how amazingly good oncology is in 2017 in helping people beat cancer. It's so impressive that so many young people who are diagnosed with cancer can now come through the treatment and pretty much get back to a normal life. And that's something that has really moved on a lot in just a few years. So you see the statistics on the slide there that a great number of people in Australia are long-term survivors of cancer, which they've had at a young age. And every year, oncology is doing better. The problem is, of course, that chemotherapy, radiotherapy, immunotherapy are life-saving, but they all have side effects, some of which can be long-term. And one of the areas that we both work in are in multidisciplinary late effects of cancer clinics, which are set up to involve doctors and nurses and therapists from a number of different specialties working together to cope with the multi-system side effects that chemotherapy and radiotherapy can have. So for example, some people who've had cancer treatment will have problems with their heart, with the brain, their nervous system. Occasionally, but thankfully not often, you are coping with a recurrence or even a primary cancer that's been caused by the treatment itself, but those are rare. We both work in the area of reproductive health because many times chemotherapy or radiotherapy can cause damage to the ability of that person to make sperm or to have healthy eggs. And what we know is that when you do surveys, 
reproductive health is one of the most important problems that survivors of cancer would like to try and solve. We're not very good at giving patients who are going into treatment a prognosis about how their fertility will survive. We can block people into groups according to the drugs and treatments that they have. On the slide here, you can see that there are certain drugs, particularly the alkylating agents like cyclophosphamide, that have a high risk of damaging the ability of the body to make eggs or sperm after treatment. And these drugs, some of them are still used quite commonly in the treatment of some cancers, so many people who are afflicted by those disorders will have to be treated with an alkylating agent like cyclophosphamide. There are other drugs, most commonly the platinum-derived drugs like carboplatin and cisplatinum, that have a moderate risk of damaging fertility. But many young women or men who are treated with those will find that later on their fertility is restored and they can have children naturally or with a bit of help from people like Rebecca and me. But this is all about the individual. And there are many people who have high-risk treatment whose fertility does recover and many others who have a moderate or even a low-risk treatment who find that they've got a permanent problem after the treatment is completed. And it's almost impossible on an individual basis to look at a person who's going into treatment and say with any degree of certainty, you need to store your fertility or you don't. Because although we can give a risk estimate for populations, the individual risk we can't calculate. The other problem with trying to give a risk is that first-line treatment might be low risk, but some people don't get rid of the cancer after first-line treatment, and so they go on to a second line, which is more aggressive. It fixes the problem, but that has damaged their ability to make sperm or eggs. So often at the start, we might recommend that someone would freeze sperm or eggs or embryos, and we're going to spend a lot of time this evening talking about that, even though we know they may well not need them. That's probably better than the alternative, which is not to do something at the start and then live to regret it later on. Radiotherapy is also damaging to the ability of a person to make sperm or eggs. For men, if you have treatment more than four gray of radiotherapy that is, is focused on the testicles, that will almost certainly cause azoospermia, inability to make sperm. But it's important to dissociate fertility in a man from his sexuality, because that's due to testosterone, and even though the man may not have sperm and be able to become a father, he might retain a good sex drive, a good libido, and be perfectly happy to have a, a good sex life with his partner. The two are totally separate. In women, sadly, the resting eggs, the primordial follicles, are sensitive to radiation, so the risk of premature ovarian failure increases with dose. And there's a double whammy. Because the other thing that can go wrong with radiotherapy in women is that the elasticity of the womb of the uterus is lost. And so even if someone can become pregnant, she may find that the, there's a high risk of miscarriage, or they may not grow a good lining to the womb, so pregnancy may be impossible. Again, that's dose-dependent and varies a lot from one person to the next. So, for an example here, this is one paper from a few years ago that just looked at the age of women when they were treated with alkylating agent cyclophosphamide and the risk of loss of fertility permanently at the different age groups. So you can see that in young people, they have a large store of eggs, so it's more likely that some will survive, although that person may have a reduced length of time in which she can become pregnant after her treatment. Whereas someone who's over 30, who's already worked through quite a large number of her natural egg store, will almost certainly become infertile because of cyclophosphamide treatment. As I said before, if, they, if people have rescue chemotherapy, so high doses of more toxic drugs, or an increasing number of young people are having stem cell transplants from bone marrow to treat various cancers, the conditioning chemotherapy that's used to eradicate the cancer before the stem cell rescue deliberately has to be very toxic in order to work, and that almost always causes infertility. But, just to be careful, I can think immediately of two young women who've had bone marrow transplant, stem cell treatment, and had conditioning chemotherapy, and then naturally made babies later, so you cannot be certain about anything. Thankfully, some other cancers are now treated with less 
go down to toxic, less toxic treatment to fertility. So, for example, an early breast cancer in 2017 often can be managed with drugs that are unlikely to damage fertility. So we don't have to recommend storing eggs or embryos for young women who are having that particular treatment. Beck and I work closely with oncologists, and we take great care to listen exactly to what their plan is for patients and what the drugs involved are. And together, we will tell patients our, our best estimate of what they might be suggested to do. So as I said, when you do surveys of young people who are cancer survivors who are getting back to normal life, and you say, what is it that you miss most in terms of the opportunities that are no longer available to you because of your cancer and your treatment, the most common thing that comes out is loss of fertility is the most distressing thing for young women and men who are cancer survivors and want to go back to normal life. So what can we do about it? Well, actually quite a lot in 2017. Louise Brown is 40 years old next year. Louise was the world's first ever IVF child. So the science of IVF began 40 years ago and has gone forward in leaps and bounds since she was born. There's now 7 million IVF babies in the world. And one in 23 Australian births is an IVF birth. That's something we're proud of. Australia leads the way in many of the IVF technologies. And from the point of view of this evening's talk, the beautiful thing is that that science of IVF can be used to help people collect eggs and then make embryos, which can then be stored for many years and used later to help them have a baby. And we'll explain a little later about exactly how that works. So storing embryos or eggs is actually quite straightforward in 2017 for most young women before they're going to have chemotherapy or radiotherapy. Alternatively, if we have very little time, so we can't run through the IVF cycle that takes two to three weeks, we can do a laparoscopic keyhole surgery and collect and freeze a piece of ovarian tissue. For most men who are post-puberty, it's not too hard to produce a sperm sample or several sperm samples in a lab or in a room adjacent to a lab, and the sperm can be frozen. It's difficult with pre-pubertal boys. They obviously can't produce a sperm sample. Occasionally, we will freeze pieces of testicle from very young male children, from boys, but it's not yet possible to make sperm from that tissue. So of the five items on that slide, the one that I'm least confident about as a fertility doctor is recommending to parents that they freeze testicular tissue for their young son before he has treatment. So here's a nice example. This was from a newspaper, and the young lady on the left had a nasty breast cancer when she was young. She was in a relationship with her partner, the gentleman on the right, and together they decided to freeze embryos before she had her breast cancer treated. Sadly, she lost her fertility because of the chemotherapy, but beautifully, she survived and is now healthy. And the two little girls, you see the baby and the daughter there, are the result of transferring the frozen thawed embryos several years after she had her initial breast cancer. Those two children would not have existed unless doctors had helped those two people to make and then freeze those embryos. And you can see the happiness in that little family that those two people wouldn't have had unless that science had been used to help them. And we have many, many stories like that. And it's a joyous part of medicine to work in because you end up helping lovely people like that have their family. So this is just a slide about how things have improved. For years, we used to freeze eggs and embryos by slowly taking them down to minus 196 in liquid nitrogen. This would be done over many hours because we thought that was the most protective way to help the egg or the embryo go through that freezing process without being damaged. Like the little penguins on the iceberg, they're slowly creeping down the iceberg, freezing themselves slowly, you hope it's less painful when they get in the water. <clears throat> but the problem is that when you slow freeze, crystals of ice form inside the egg or the embryo, and then when you thaw it, they melt and they destroy the structure of the egg and the embryo. So what we've been doing for the last few years around the world and in Sydney is to snap freeze eggs and embryos. If you buy your frozen peas from Woolies and have them from your tea tonight, they've been snap frozen as soon as they've been picked. 
And so food producers have known for many years that snap freezing is the most effective way to keep the flavor and the health of the peas. The same with eggs and embryos. And vitrification, which is snap freezing, has really proven successful in freezing eggs and embryos compared with the old techniques. So talk about egg freezing. The good thing about egg freezing is it's only the woman who freezes and then has control over those eggs. There's no need to have a man involved, which most of the women listening this evening would agree is a good thing. What you have to do is the first half, <coughs> she's copied it, <laughs> what you have to do is the first half of an IVF cycle. So you have the drugs, the hormone injections that takes two weeks, once a day injection with a little pen, which is truly not painful. And in contrast to many of the treatments that people have for chemotherapy, radiotherapy, is, is very simple and straightforward. There would be two or three ultrasound scans and blood tests to monitor the growth of those egg follicles. And then a small surgical procedure with a vaginal internal scan, a needle running inside the scanner that can be pushed to the ovary on the left and the right to collect the eggs. It takes 25 minutes to do, and you may have an anesthetic or sedation to do that. You can start that at any time of the monthly menstrual cycle. It, therefore, it can be done in just over two weeks from start to finish. And chemotherapy can be started just a few days later. So the eggs can then be vitrified, snap frozen, and they can rest in a frozen state for many years. The longest I've known a baby to be born from a frozen egg from the time it was frozen to the time it was thawed is 23 years. And if most people can't make their minds up within 23 years to start a family, Perhaps it's going to be too late because being a mom at 60 is not a good look. Egg freezing is still quite new around the world in the literature. There's about 10,000 births reported. In contrast with the 7 million IVF kids, that's a small number. But we believe, and we're, we're looking at them hard, these children are healthy. Even after being frozen as eggs for many years, they're growing up fine. They're going through normal schools, making normal friendships and relationships, etc. So the obvious question is, is it worth it? How well does it work? And here's a, an abstract of just a few studies that have been um, published in the last few years. Um, so you can see on the right-hand side that from frozen eggs, there's a realistic chance that you can have at least one baby, maybe more, when later on you meet your partner and have his sperm fertilize the thawed egg and put the embryo back in the uterus. So we can see nice implantation rates and pregnancy rates on this slide. But there is a bit of a catch, because all of these studies were published on women who are under 35 when they froze their eggs. And to me, and I'm sure to Beck also, that's the critical thing, that freezing eggs for women over 40 almost never works. It is a stressful thing to do. I am saying that it's very straightforward. It is, but it does stress people. And at already vulnerable part in their lives, I'm not sure it's a worthwhile and sensible piece of medicine if someone is over 40 and freezes her eggs. And personally, I try and discourage the women over 38 from freezing. And ideally, you would do this with younger people. Of course, many in the cancer community have had their treatment when they're in their teens or 20s. Their egg number and their egg quality is very robust. So those people are ideal for freezing eggs and will probably have a good outcome later on. OK, so let's talk about freezing embryos. The first thing you do when you freeze is you take all the water out of the embryo, so you dehydrate it before you vitrify it in liquid nitrogen. And the embryos on the left have been dehydrated. They look pretty awful. And when I look down the microscope and see those, I think there's no way that they can make a healthy child. But when you rehydrate them after thawing, which you can see on the right, they go back to being healthy embryos again. And children born from frozen embryos are now over a million in number. They've been observed for many years, and they're absolutely fine, except, and apologies for the dad joke, they have a lifelong aversion to ice cream. Thank you. <laughs> well, you've got to try. So this is what we do in 2017. Another piece of modern technology that's really revolutionized the way we can do this and makes it easier for us to help people. We now grow embryos out for five days in culture in the lab before we freeze them. So you can see on the picture here the difference between day three, when most embryos only have eight cells and are quite brittle and can be damaged by freezing quite easily, up to day five, when they've got about 250 cells 
and are more robust and tough, and so they can survive the freeze-thaw process a lot better. And being able to culture out to day five has opened up all sorts of possibilities that we couldn't do in the earlier days when the lab wasn't such a good place and we had to freeze embryos on day two or day three. I mentioned earlier that sometimes we just don't have time. It does take about two weeks to do this, and sometimes the oncologist will say to us, well, look, we want to start the chemotherapy in two days. This is a nasty cancer. We don't want to take the risk of it spreading any further. We need to get on with this. What can we offer? And also, what can we offer to young women and young girls who are just too young to go through the hormone injections and ultrasounds, etc., of an IVF cycle? So for many years now, we've been collecting pieces of ovarian tissue. You do that with keyhole surgery, a small procedure. It takes about half an hour to do. The person takes one day to recover, so can start chemotherapy very quickly afterwards. This is what happens, and apologies for the surgical slide, but I hope you'll agree it's not too difficult. On the left, you can see a picture of the ovary. That's the white thing with the fallopian tube draped over it. We're looking at it down a camera that's been put through a little cut in the belly button. And we have a little surgical instrument which is holding the ovary steady. And then on the right, you can see the ovary after we've taken a piece of tissue and then cauterized the base to stop bleeding. That tissue can be taken out of the body, and we have it in the lab. <coughs> Excuse me. And then we use fine instruments to di dissect it into small sections that you can see on the top. Those are then frozen, and again, they can stay in the freezer for many years. When the woman later wants to have a child, you do another keyhole surgery to put the grafted tissue back into the body. And people put it in all sorts of places. Often it goes into the pelvis where the ovary was. But you can put it in the forearm and collect eggs from tissue there. One of the problems with this is, if the person had a, a blood-borne cancer, like a leukemia, possibly a lymphoma, you may be regrafting cancer back into the patient, which is obviously a disaster. <coughs> so we have to be very careful by looking at samples of those sections to make sure that we're not regrafting cancer cells to the patient. But that is something that we're very careful with. And so far, there's not been a report from this treatment of a cancer being regrafted. <coughs> so I'm just recovering from this stupid cold. Um, so in contrast with the data I've been showing you from IVF, where we've got millions of children, frozen embryos the same, frozen eggs where we've got about 10,000, my survey of the world literature a few months ago, there's less than 100 live births from frozen ovarian tissue, but every year more and more reports are happening. So this is still experimental. There are a couple of groups like ours in Australia that do this. And there have been three pregnancies with Dr. Kate Stern, our good friend in Melbourne. So far, to my knowledge, we've not had anyone in Sydney who's had the grafting done, so we haven't got a pregnancy in Sydney. And you can see from the slide, if you can read it, apologies, it's very small. These are data from centers all over the globe that are offering this treatment now. What we see frequently is people will freeze, but then they don't come back to have the tissue back because either they get pregnant naturally or they've done an IVF or something. So they don't need to have the ovarian tissue grafted back. But it's a good, if you like, insurance policy that it's there if they need it. This is one case report that I quite like, and you'll see why in the next slide. But the little picture on the left, each of those circular structures is a resting egg within a thing called a primordial follicle. And you can see that because this was tissue taken from a young girl in childhood, there are many, many, many eggs. There's probably a million eggs in both ovaries at that age. So a small piece of tissue can give you a lot of eggs in store. And it's obviously important only to take a small piece, because if that person's fertility does survive the chemotherapy, she has a chance of being pregnant naturally. So we'd never remove both ovaries, for example, from someone who's doing a tissue free. But the reason I put this in is just this little picture. Now, this is going to tax me. Do you want the pointer? It's a very sensitive mouse, yeah. Mm. Where we go, that one? I know, the, the little uh, pen. The pen, got yep. it. And then the red dot. Cool. Yep. Okay, so what we see is a time zero, the graft was put back into the body. 
and you can see that over time the FSH hormone level comes down showing it's beginning to work and estrogen in the dots comes up so this person's going to ovulate and the graft worked for a while and then had a pregnancy. So you can see the hormones secreted by the graft before this graft was put in, very low estrogen and high FSH, and you can see how the estrogen goes up and the FSH comes down. And that is lasting over many months. So that's a nice demonstration of how well this can work. Okay, so it's important to remember that cancer affects males and females, men and women equally. So for many years at the Royal Hospital for Women, where we work for over 50 years now, we've been freezing sperm for young men with cancer. It's a long-standing practice. It's easy to do with most people. It's cheap. Some men with cancer are already sick before they freeze, so we may not have good quality sperm, which means that the man and his partner may have to do an IVF or an ICSI injecting sperm into eggs later on. Freezing testicular tissue for young boys, as I said, is still experimental, and we don't quite know yet what to do. But if we're freezing for a six-year-old, we've got 20 or 30 years of science ahead of us before that young man is going to want to use the tissue. So to summarize what I've talked about, I'm very impressed with the speed at which the science moves in our specialty. Sometimes it's hard just to keep abreast with all the things that are happening as experts. So part of our job is to communicate with you and share with you our knowledge and help explain what can and sometimes what can't be done, because we cannot work miracles sometimes. Sadly, cancer treatment for many people will cause infertility, but there may be recovery for a lot of people, and after recovery we can run tests to show whether there is function in the ovaries making eggs or the testicles making sperm. And those people who have stored eggs, embryos or sperm, have a good chance of having children later, even if the chemotherapy has destroyed their chances of a natural pregnancy without help from clever size. So what I'd like to do is hand the mouse over to Beck, who's going to take the second half of this presentation. Thank you so much. That was fascinating. I think just before we move on, there was one question there from Heather, just asking, does the length of time on ice affect the effectiveness of the fertility mm. of the egg? Good question, Heather, and thanks for asking that, because it lets me tell a nice little story, which is in the US, women who've frozen their eggs are bequeathing their eggs to their daughters in their will. I've not heard of it in Australia. I think if you work it through in your head, it's a little bit weird, but it shows you that they can survive for many years, and the quality does not seem to deteriorate. They kept a liquid nitrogen at almost absolute zero temperature, so no, they will live as long as we will, and maybe longer. Heather's response there, wow. <laughs> wow, it just yeah. blows me away. <laughs> All right, thanks so much. Over to you, Rebecca. Okay, hello, and thank you for inviting me. So I'm Dr. Rebecca Deans. I'm a gynaecologist and fertility specialist. Also work with Professor Ledger at the Royal Hospital of Women and University of New South Wales. I also have an appointment at Sydney Children's Hospital, so I'm quite involved in um, young children who are diagnosed early with um, cancers and go through a lot of the early discussions with the children and their families about what they'd like to do in preserving their fertility. And I'm also involved in the multidisciplinary team that Bill mentioned, the long-term follow-up clinic where we actually assess women um, and men, in fact, um, for other medical conditions that arise which are to do with their treatment rather than their original condition. So we look at things like um, diabetes progression or developing um, developing um, high cholesterol as a result of treatment. And all of these things really can affect your long-term fertility and they affect um, people in the community in their fertility and they also can affect um, cancer survivors as well. So my presentation is really going to extend a little bit beyond Bill and I tried very hard not to double up on the things that he's mentioned, although he's been very thorough, and I agree with Neil, who was a great presentation, and um, I, I, um, I'd like to just go through some of the other aspects of um, fertility after cancer. So, oh, it is very jumpy. Okay, so the other options that I, I thought I'd go through, um, because when you see a lot of these presentations, you don't always think about other things you can do, because you can't use your own eggs 
or your own sperm, then there are always there is always the possibility of using donor. And that technology is available to people in 2017, which is quite fascinating. Um, it always astounds me that we're able to use donor eggs and embryos in your uterus because it's so hard to put any other donor tissue into your body and pregnancy is such a specific state that it, it protects the, um, the, uh, the embryo from attack from the host, which is the, um, the mother who's carrying the baby. So we're very lucky that we can use that technology and use donor eggs and donor sperm. And in fact, we have excellent pregnancy rates using those for women who are infertile generally and women who are infertile after cancer treatment. And then you really need to think that if all else fails, adoption is also possible. And although it is difficult in Australia, um, it, it's still possible and it's also possible to adopt from other countries and perhaps um, looking at countries where um, children perhaps wouldn't have a, a great life, but if you could bring them to somewhere like Australia, you could give them a better life. Um, then there is surrogacy for, for patients or for women who um, can't carry a pregnancy for, um, for various reasons. And then as I mentioned, donor sperm as well as donor egg. But just to go back to look at the testing to see what um, to see whether you are fertile after cancer treatment. So you may have been treated for a cancer when you were five or six years of age and, and may not have actually had the opportunity to store um, eggs, um, for instance, or, or for men's sperm. And then suddenly now you're 25 years of age in a relationship and, and are interested to know what your ovarian reserve is. And I really see this a lot in very young children, but even teenagers who, when they have their diagnosis of cancer, don't really want to talk about fertility right there and then because it's not on their radar. And in fact, sometimes it's almost a little bit embarrassing to address these, these issues. So they don't want to talk about it. And it's often the parents that drive the discussions, just trying <coughs> to look at the future for that individual. What we can do down the track to check to see whether you are fertile is to look at your ovarian reserve. And the ways that we do this are, either an ultrasound which looks at the very small follicles, um, the antral follicles which you can see on a pelvic ultrasound and that Bill alluded to earlier. You can do an early day two or three FSH which is that hormone that drives the ovary to develop the follicles and if that is elevated then we worry about the number of follicles that you have in your, in your ovaries. Inhibin B is also a blood test which can be done but Really now it's superseded by a test called the AMH test, which is anti-malarian hormone. This is a hormone that um, uh, supports those early antral follicles. And the ovary is very clever in that it will produce only a number of follicles, um, which is a proportion of what it has left. So as, as Bill mentioned earlier, when you are born as a girl, you are born with many million um, follicles in your ovaries and throughout your life, whether you're menstruating or not, you have a drop off of those number of, of follicles. And um, at, when you hit um, puberty, there's only a few hundred thousand and then there's only a few hundred by the time you reach menopause. What we're trying to work out with these ovarian reserve testing is where you stand in that, in terms of your number of eggs. We can't test, unfortunately, the quality of the eggs and we think that um, chemotherapy, for instance, does have some impact on the quality of eggs. Um, and we know that as you get closer to menopause, your quality will fall just as the egg number falls. But the tests that we have are looking at the follicles that are coming to the surface. And as I said about that clever ovary, um, the ovary will only send up a proportion of um, follicles that it has in its store. So if the ovary is looking a bit depleted, it won't send out 25 eggs every month. It might only send out five eggs a month. So we measure hormones and we count those eggs and it tells us how many, um, how many eggs we think you have um, left or it gives us an indication of how long you have before you reach menopause. And more importantly, it gives us an idea of how many eggs you can hope to achieve if we do do an IVF procedure to collect the eggs after you've had that cancer treatment. So this is a graph looking at that anti-malarian hormone. One of the tricky things that I encounter actually in looking at cancer survivors and AMH is that we think that 
that AMH level actually peaks around 25. Um, it doesn't necessarily peak at the time. I mean, technically, you, you probably should have the highest AMH when you're born, and then it should just follow a graph down. But we think that there's a little peak at 25. So when you're doing testing at a time when girls are a little bit more interested in finding out whether they are fertile after their cancer treatment, um, they might be 18 or 19, and we're not sure whether, if it's low, whether it stands to increase a little bit before it drops off, or whether it really is um, on its way down. And I think with time, we'll have more answers for this as we know more about the AMH test. I think, though, if it is low when you are a teenager, it's not a, a great sign. And so often at that time, we do offer um, the egg collection procedure, for instance, to try and collect eggs if you didn't store them when you were a child and treated with your cancer. And then just to go through what we do for a donor egg cycle. So um, Bill discussed very briefly the process of, um, of an IVF um, collection. So it, it involves some injections for either the woman who's having the cycle or if she elects to have a donor, the donor will inject throughout the month with a hormone called FSH and then a second hormone to stop um, a premature ovulation, so to stop one follicle becoming a dominant follicle. Because in IVF we try and drive all of those follicles up um, in a synchronous development so we can collect as many as possible. So for donor eggs, um, the woman who is the donor goes through the egg collection procedure. So goes through the, the um, injections, which take um, somewhere between 10 days and two weeks. And then the process of the egg collection is a needle that goes through the vagina wall into the ovary itself. And then those follicles, which are the little cysts that the egg live in, are aspirated and collected in that needle, as well as the fluid, is hopefully the egg. And you can have a look at the eggs um, and store them at that time or fertilise them with your partner. So the donor eggs can be sourced through anyone really, although we generally, um, ideally it's someone who's had their family because there are some risks with doing an IVF procedure and we like it to be someone, uh, particularly if they're a relative or a friend that's had their um, own family so they don't hold any regret about donating eggs down the track. And there are a lot of ethical considerations when we start talking about donor um, donors and donor eggs. You can also source eggs commercially um, even within Australia and also a lot of women do go overseas to source eggs um, when they can't have um, get eggs locally. Um, and as I said, the, the donor goes through the egg collection procedure. And then what happens is embryos are created by either putting sperm with those eggs in a fresh cycle or if those donor eggs are frozen, often you need to do a thing called ICSI, which is where you inject a sperm into the egg and then you develop, you create the embryos and grow them out to day five in the way that um, Bill um, described. And then what happens is the embryo can then be transferred into the survivor's uterus. And interestingly, and it's a question that a lot of women ask is even if they're postmenopausal, we can generally make that uterus um, respond with hormonal support except that early embryo. And we can do that with um, usually an oral, oral tablets of um, oestrogen and um, the oestrogen will make the lining of the uterus grow and this can occur even in um, of uteruses who are, that are 60 years old for instance, although it might not be such a good look after the baby's delivered. But the um, uterus is capable of, of um, accepting an embryo and a lot of people get that confused and think that their uterus after the menopause won't be able to accept a pregnancy, but it can with the right hormonal support. And then following um, implantation of that embryo, we give progesterone, which is a second hormone um, to, to support that early embryo. And then we just do the usual um, pregnancy monitoring where we do um, blood tests to look for the pregnancy hormone, beta-HCG, and then early ultrasounds. And then after uh, about 12 weeks, that um, even earlier really, the embryo starts to develop and create a lot of hormones which support itself. And then the patient goes through essentially a normal pregnancy, the same as anyone else, and can have a vaginal delivery or a caesarean section as much as they would have normally. Being pregnant will um, stimulate all the other parts of your body, so you're able to breastfeed after pregnancy, even though you um, 
you have, have a donor egg, it doesn't make a difference. So it's amazing that the body, the things that the body can do. So it's just a, a thing to think about for women who are postmenopausal, that there are options out there for them if they didn't store eggs in the early phases. But we do know that pregnancy is slightly high risk for women who have had a cancer treatment and it's probably a combination of things. We know that the cancer treatment itself can do nasty things to your body. It's meant to do nasty <coughs> things to the cancer and then as a byproduct it can affect um, the vascularity of your body, it can affect um, the way that you metabolise your fats for instance so it makes you more likely to have things like diabetes in life and in pregnancy as well and you might develop hypertension which is high blood pressure and that can also affect pregnancy. So you do need to be monitored a little bit closer than a woman who um, has never had a cancer treatment or chemotherapy. And this is especially the case if your cancer treatment involves radiation particularly to the pelvis and Bill mentioned this earlier and that radiation to the pelvis can affect the testicles but it can also affect the uterus and its ability to to um, grow that embryo through to a live baby. And we think that it's because um, the radiation can affect the, the blood supply and the blood supply to the uterus is crucial for allowing blood supply to form at the placenta. And if you have placental problems, this can cause ongoing issues with the, the, um, the early embryo. There's a slightly increased risk of miscarriage if you've had radiation um, of the pelvis there's an increased risk of having the baby a little bit early, so having a premature baby or a baby that is small for gestational age and um, we need to monitor that baby quite closely if we think there's going to be a placental problem because we may need to deliver the baby earlier than it normally would be because sometimes it's safer for a baby to be in a nursery NICU environment and fed externally than within the body. And we do find also that women have slightly more difficulties with establishing their milk supply interestingly even though it's definitely possible but um, I did a study a few years ago looking at uh, survivors from Sydney Children's Hospital and the, the women that had had children following their cancer treatment and a lot more of those women compared to the normal population had difficulty establishing milk supply which is something interesting we weren't really sure exactly why that's the case. So then just moving on to other options if donor eggs are not the go for you um, or even perhaps if your uterus was removed um, as part of your treatment. Adoption and fostering is, is possible for, for um, couples in Australia although it is difficult and much harder to get um, access to, um, to babies born and there just aren't enough babies which are being put up for adoption. Um, often if you foster a child first it's easier to then adopt that child and as I said earlier inter-country adoption is also possible and there are agencies that are available to facilitate this. It often takes many many years but priority is given to younger couples which tends to be the couples that are affected by cancer treatment as, a, as compared to perhaps um, couples who are infertile because they've elected to delay starting their family and by the time they um, make a decision to adopt, they may be in their 40s and really it's very, very hard to adopt when you're in your 40s. So I think if you're considering this as an option as a couple, you should try and put your name down earlier because there's a long wait list for um, adoption. Just to um, we had a question from Neil asking around if your cancer history mm -hmm. has any sort of exclusion um, criteria around um, adopting a child. Certainly not excluding but it probably is taken into consideration because they, they want to ensure that the adopted child is going to go to um, a family where the parents are likely to live for some time and be able to bring up that child mm. in, in, a, in a good way. Mm -hmm. And so they, they um, do take it into consideration. So they would look at the general health. Mm -hmm. So if the health is affected by um, things like diabetes or blood pressure, then it may be taken into consideration, mm -hmm. but certainly not excluded. Mm -hmm. Okay, you. that's all right. And then surrogacy is another option if the uterus is affected by radiation or even if you've had a hysterectomy or pelvic clearance as a result of cancer treatment. Um, and in fact, we can even do all sorts of combinations where we can use a donor egg, which may or may not be the, the surrogate's egg and put it into a separate mum with your partner's sperm 
and then uh, the surrogate delivers a baby. When this occurs, um, the parents who will receive the child will need to adopt back that child because the birth mother is the surrogate mother. Unfortunately, surrogacy is quite difficult in Australia and can only be achieved altruistically. So someone has to put up their hand and say, I would be happy to be your surrogate. And commonly this is um, a cousin or a sister or a very close friend. Um, but, and I've even seen mothers be surrogates for their own children um, and help some women through this process. Surrogacy Australia, though, is a, is a great resource for, um, for people who are considering surrogacy and they can help link um, couples to women who are very kind-hearted and decide that that's what they would like to do in the world, the way that they would like to give back. Is they often say to me, there aren't a lot of things I can necessarily do, but I, can, I do pregnancy well and I, I'm very happy to give that to someone and that's going to be my contribution. So it's certainly an option for couples who are... Um, requiring uterus um, and can't have children. And then donor sperm, um, we're getting so much better now at trying to store sperm from um, the individual child and or, or um, uh, patient with cancer. But if it is a child, as Bill alluded to, and, you, um, and we know that testicular biopsy is, is relatively experimental and we don't know whether it we ever will be able to mature those sperm to be able to be good for fertility. Sometimes fathers donate their sperm on behalf of their sons when they're diagnosed, and I see this a lot in the children's hospital. And sometimes relatives can donate sperm down the track. Um, brothers can donate for, for each other, and friends can also donate. We can also um, access donor sperm through altruistic donation, so men who once again want to do something for the world and um, donate to a couple who can't conceive, or even commercial organisations where you, you can access um, donor sperm in that way. And when we get the sperm, it doesn't necessarily mean IVF for the woman. We often do a process called intrauterine insemination. So we track a woman through her ovulation, through blood tests and ultrasounds, and when we see that the woman is about to ovulate, we put the sperm up um, with a catheter, which is a small plastic tube, and we um, feed that into the uterus and put the sperm in there. So we put the sperm as close to the egg as possible and hope for a natural conception. And of course, if that doesn't work, then we have the IVF process where we put the sperm right next to each other in a Petri dish or inject the sperm into the egg. So I guess in summary for my talk, um, my message is if there are no stored eggs because you didn't have the opportunity at the time prior to treatment, there are other options that exist for survivors. And if starting your family is a goal, then this really is still possible after cancer treatment. Um, and you really sometimes need to think outside the box. If that's your priority, then you can achieve it. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I'll just take the mouse back off you and we can move forward. That was another fascinating presentation and thank you for giving that other perspective as well if those other options aren't available to someone. Um, we'll move into some questions that uh, some of the participants who registered sent in uh, at the time of registration. So if we start off with the first question there, what tests would you advise we have done before going ahead with egg harvesting or becoming pregnant post-treatment? So which one of you would be most yeah. yeah, so um, basically it's the test that I mentioned within my mm -hmm. presentation. So the anti-malarian hormone, which gives us an idea about the number of eggs and a pelvic ultrasound mm -hmm. to um, have a look at the uterus and particularly looking at that lining of the uterus to make sure that that uterus is, um, can produce a nice lining that can take an embryo. And mm -hmm. they're the, the two main tests. For men, it's a semen analysis, so mm -hmm. an ejaculated specimen, and then that's looked at under a microscope, and we look at various markers, so we look at the total number and the way that the sperm swim and the way that the sperm look, mm -hmm. and that gives us an idea for men and women as to how fertile they are. Yeah. I think, Lauren, also we, we can see from the chat box, there's a question from Rebecca mm -hmm. saying, is there a risk of heart failure during pregnancy after having had chemotherapy and about monitoring? And that brings up another part of the answer to that question, which is that if someone has had chemotherapy, radiotherapy, mm -hmm. it's important to check that she is healthy enough to carry a pregnancy 
without too much risk before we go into having treatment. So at the Royal Hospital for Women, we have an obstetric physician, Dr. Sandra Lowe, who will see young women who are thinking of pregnancy after cancer before they're pregnant to do the tests on their function of their heart, their lungs, kidneys, etc., to make sure that there's not going to be jeopardy in pregnancy. Easy to organize, it's not too difficult to do, but very important. And also, as Rebecca says, after pregnancy, making sure that that woman's system recovers completely after the stress of the pregnancy. Mm, that's right. And then certain chemotherapy agents are more likely to give you heart failure. And we do monitor those in the long-term follow-up clinic. And those, if you have had um, those particular regimes, then that's important to know about before you get pregnant because it puts you at that elevated risk. Mm. And that might lead a little bit into that next question where someone was advised to wait two years before considering having a baby um, due to the chemo that they received. So are there studies um, regarding birth defects after chemotherapy or what was, do you think the reason for that advice might have been? There are studies and they're mostly fairly reassuring that the risk of DNA damage in eggs that are lying quietly dormant in the ovary during chemotherapy that are then fertilized later is small. So I think the answer to that question is it depends on the individual circumstances of that person and that couple. So if she's young and has time to wait, it makes sense to let the chemotherapy drugs really wash out of the system before trying for pregnancy. And also in that two-year period, it might be that natural fertility comes back so you're avoiding having to do an IVF or using your stored eggs or embryos, which is obviously a lot nicer and easier and cheaper to get pregnant naturally. But if the person involved is maybe in her late 30s, time is precious. It's very different trying to be pregnant at age 36 than at age 38 or 40. So for me, when someone's a bit older, probably six months waiting to let the chemotherapy clear out is enough run the test that Beck just said to see if natural fertility is coming back, and if not, maybe try for a pregnancy with stored eggs or embryos at that point. It all comes down to the consultation that you would have with one of us, along with your cancer specialist, looking at the individual drugs that you've had to have for your own cancer, because as you know, that's very variable. Final comment, there's a lot of new drugs around that are specifics and immunotherapies, and we know very little about the toxicity of those drugs to eggs and embryos because they're new. So in those circumstances, it's probably wise to be conservative, and that two-year period is probably sensible if you've had a new drug that, frankly, we just don't know if it's going to affect the health of the baby and the child. Mm, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Great. Um, and the next question there's a little bit different, but um, asking about the role of an exercise physiologist in both the management of the cancer as well as the potential to enhance fertility. So, you know, someone can speak to that. Yes, please give this. I one. love this question. <laughs> um, I was recently at an award ceremony, and we gave an award to the best young investigator um, in, in 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 Australian research in, in this area. And her PhD had been looking at the role of exercise physiology in just this circumstance. And what she found very clearly, and maybe not surprisingly, is that if you can persuade cancer survivors to get involved in an exercise program with some guidance from an exercise physiologist, doing something they enjoy, their return to well-being and physical and mental fitness is quicker. And it's very clear from the research that it, it, it is about wellness as a whole human being holistically and exercise programs that are tailored because sometimes people are not yet well, so they're limited in what they can do. So an individualized program can be helpful. And I'm sure that that will be the same for return of fertility, that getting a normal body mass index and having a healthy body fat mass is important for men and women who want to become parents. And so involving an exercise physiologist is a wise thing to do. Mm. That's great to hear. Um, the Cancer Council in New South Wales has yeah. a few healthy lifestyle programs which can support people in that phase after treatment. Um, so the Healthy Living After Cancer program as well as the Enriching Survivorship programs are just a few that are available. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then and a question there around um, how many women in Australia have undergone regrafting of ovarian tissue and have there been any live pregnancies um, using regrafted ovarian tissue in Australia. Okay, so I think that this was covered in Bill's talk, but 
um, in Australia we're, we're relatively new, but having said that, around the world it's a relatively new mm -hmm. art, if you like. Um, three that we are aware of, we had a, a bit of a chat before and I think um, they've all been in Melbourne as mm -hmm. far as we're aware, none in any other states. Um, and the, the issue is we actually don't know the denominator. So we can't give you a percentage because there's, mm. there hasn't been up till now, although there is now we're hoping to come up with a registry so we know how successful things are. But I think lots of little bits of ovarian tissue have been stored all over the place and we don't know A, how many people have gone back to use them, which is mainly um, our experience in that we've stored a lot of these and people haven't come back and put them back in, mm -hmm. or whether people have had attempts and whether pregnancies have occurred. Mm -hmm. So I think with our new registry that um, Antoinette Anazodo is, is setting up, um, we'll have a lot more information going forward. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, and, and we touched on this one again um, a little bit earlier, but just sort of, if, did you want to expand yeah, any more well, on the success rate for over 40-year-olds? The important thing is the age at which the embryos were made, because once they're in liquid nitrogen, they don't age. So if someone is 40 or over with fresh eggs, the chance of a baby, whether they've had cancer or not, is not great, because the quality of those eggs from someone who's a bit older is not high. Whereas if the embryos were made when that person was 30, and you put them back when she's 40 or 42, not only is the chance of pregnancy high, but the chance of a pregnancy problem is low. So miscarriage is low, the chance of a child with a problem like Down syndrome is low because the embryos don't age once they're in liquid nitrogen. Mm. Great. Um, we have answered the questions on the screen there. I noticed that Rebecca um, did send a question in around discussing the cost of any of these procedures. Now, we don't have a huge amount of time yet, but perhaps if we could just touch on it very briefly. Yeah, sure. So it depends on what the procedures are. So generally in the public hospitals, when you're having freezing of um, things like sperm, it's under Medicare. And so, and we're, and um, Bill is, in a team is working very hard to get more Medicare numbers um, so that some of the ongoing freeze costs can be covered um, mm. under Medicare. But in the public hospital, generally freezing sperm is done free of or well, under Medicare only, so no additional cost for the patient. Um, storing of ovarian tissue, once again, it is done in the same way. For egg collection procedures, unfortunately, a lot of IVF is done in the private sector. And, and there are costs associated with this. Most uh, units, though, have a reduced cost for patients who are cancer survivors. Mm -hmm. So it's probably um, worth just checking to see how much those costs are and perhaps asking the question as to whether you could perhaps go somewhere else, um, such as a public hospital, to mm -hmm. store um, eggs. Mm -hmm. okay. I think just to expand a little bit mm -hmm. on that. Both Beck and I have both practice in public and private sector, mm -hmm. and it's always wise to have a consult with someone to explore that. Mm -hmm. And the, the major IVF groups in Sydney will always give a dollar quote so people know exactly what they're having to spend ahead of time. Mm -hmm. And the big IVF groups do make concession because we appreciate how hard it is to have gone through cancer, and we try and keep the cost down to as low as we can. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you both. We're almost out of time, so just a little bit around um, some further support and information. So um, if you have any questions um, or would like some more advice, we encourage you to call the Cancer Council on 13 11 20 during business hours on Monday to Friday. We also have the Cancer Council online community where you can chat online with others, share your story, um, gain support from others who have been in a similar situation to you. Um, and if anything tonight has triggered anything for you, we encourage you to call Lifeline on 13 11 14 where there's 24-hour telephone crisis support available to you. And just a quick reminder that as you exit tonight's um, presentation, if you could please take the time to complete the exit survey. We will also be sending out a link of the webinar recording, so if you missed anything or if you'd like to watch it again, that'll be sent to you along with a list of resources that were included in the presentations tonight as well if you want to look into them further. And finally, a very big thank you to our wonderful panel. I think they've done a superb job and um, I've certainly learned a lot myself, so thank you again for coming along tonight and sharing your expertise with us all. 
and thank you to everyone who's tuned in and uh, we hope to see you at the, the next webinar as well. Thank you.